Hey everybody, welcome back to Deterministic. I'm Brandon Conkle, and this channel is where I explore different ways to embrace more determinism, bring more predictability into our day-to-day -day programming, and avoid the kind of crazy chaos and trash fires that we all hate in production. Today, I'm going to cover a rather tricky topic, generic associated types in Rust. Uh, they've just landed with version 1.65 as a stable feature with some caveats. Uh, when I tried to explain them in the last episode of the rest review I failed miserably and as a result I resolved to spend some more time learning about what they mean and how they relate to higher kindedness and things like that so uh, to dig in deeper I went to the rust RFC book that uh, I think does a really good job of explaining what they really are, what higher kindedness means, how it's a step towards the kind of full higher kindedness that we see in languages like Haskell. I've experienced it there in, in OCaml and PureScript and things like that, things from the ML family of languages. Uh, this RFC book explains this topic pretty well. I will share the link in the show notes here, but I think what is great about this description is they go into what kindedness is in general. So they use this function signature as an example to start out with. So if you look at this function, it is not, the function not takes a Boolean argument and returns a Boolean. So another way to say that is that applying an argument of type bool to the not function yields a result of a bool. So in the article here, they go into the kind of notation that you'll see in Haskell or OCaml or the languages that I was talking about before, uh, where you'll have a type which leads to another type, or you might have multiple arguments like this. You might have uh, three parameters, so a Boolean, a care, and another Boolean that leads to a Boolean. Or if you're familiar with languages that support auto currying, uh, this article calls it an exotic feature that it, it doesn't go into, but <laughs> it's definitely a really common part of functional languages. But you would typically see these with uh, arrow, sign or arrow operators in between each one. So bool leads to care, leads to bool, leads to bool, because you could call it with one argument, and then you would get back a function that return that needs the next two arguments in order to finally get to the result. Uh, but they specifically are not going down that kind of exotic route and they are going specifically for uh, just simple type operators that construct a new type. So uh, they say here terms of a higher kind. So this would be the arguments like we're talking about on the function. Those are called type operators and type operators, which have a return type, essentially those are called type constructors. So we're already familiar with those in rest in general. So uh, with things like aliases or types with generic parameters like vec here, uh, it takes a generic parameter, so that's a type operator, and then it returns a type, a vec of whatever type you gave it, wrapping it up. Uh, so that's considered a type constructor. But these type constructors aren't allowed in, a in a associated types right now. So going back up here, an associated type would be inside a trait like this. So they have the streaming iterator example here. It's called lending iterator elsewhere. Um, it has a type here of item. Now, right now, pre 1.65, you could not provide this lifetime parameter here. That would be against the syntax. And now with 1.65, you can. So what it's doing here is essentially saying you can already have uh, type operators and constructors on methods inside a trait. So now you can have them on associated types as well. So what does all this mean? Well, there's another article that provides a more detailed example here. Uh, this is the Generic Associated Types Initiative homepage. And they have an explainer section over here that goes in a little bit more detail about implementing this iterable trait. Uh, and they even have a REST playground example. So um, I'll pull up, I have kind of a before version of this REST playground example. And then I'll look at the after version that they provide in that uh, GAT initiative uh, repo. But you have this trait, this iterable trait here. Uh, it's the kind of iterator which would yield values that have a lifetime 
tied to the instance of the self instance when this iter method is called. So whatever the lifetime of self is when iter is called, that's the lifetime that should be passed into this iterator here, uh, which would allow you to iterate over that a vector or a slice, things like that, yielding overlapping mutable subslices with each iteration. Uh, and this is how you can uh, start moving towards zero copy, uh, working with data and not having to duplicate it. Um, there are definitely some good applications for that. Essentially, though, when you try to implement this kind of a trait without generic associated types, you run into the conundrum that they've illustrated here. They've got the, uh, this actually should be iterator, <laughs> because that matches our signature up here. So they've got uh, iterator and item, but they don't really know what lifetime to use here because the lifetime of the self that's in scope when the inner method is called is not in scope in this outer trait definite trait implementation definition here. So this C lifetime here is what we want, but we can't use it yet because we can't take that as a, a parameter. We can't pass it in here at the end of this invocation and say, okay, yeah, that's the lifetime we need to pass into this type internally. This is the playground updated for 165. So you can see we have the type item now taking the collection lifetime and then they're constraining that to say, okay, collection needs to be referring to the self of this that is implementing this trait. Same thing with the iterator. They have the lifetime there and then they pass it into item like that. Um, so you can see you're passing that lifetime that, that really is from this entry point here, this iterable function or iter function, uh, but then we're passing it back up into these generic, these associated types here for the trait. Uh, so with that, you can implement iterator for your iter struct, and then you can implement iterable for slices, for vectors, for whatever. Um, you can call the function as many times as you need inside because it has a lifetime that it can accurately keep track of and no longer needs to make it a fun, fun, effing once <laughs> uh, function that can only be called once. Uh, so let's run this and see. Bingo. We get the ex results that we expect. So the final, uh, final element here would be a six and the final element here would be a 12 because it's doubling uh, by counting it twice here. So that's how the lending iterable works. That was an example that everyone talks about. I hadn't actually seen it broken down in a way that I could explain until I got into this uh, Rust playground though. So going back to the generic associated types initiative page, if you notice in the design pattern section, um, there's an explanation of the different design patterns that generic associated types enables. Uh, and it talks about here, um, here are some workarounds before GATS were available. So uh, graphene was using box types, but boxing adds dynamic dispatch overhead and it prevents inlining, which is something that the compiler does to improve performance. Uh, and it definitely makes send and sync, uh, making things multi-threaded or multi-thread safe, thread safe, wh whatever the word is there. Uh, it makes it more challenging. Um, another section here that they talk about is the mini modes pattern, which was really interesting to me uh, because it's a type of uh, interaction I think I've, I've done in languages like OCaml, but uh, not in Rust before, certainly. So they have the example of a parser here that has a go function, but this go function wants to have two different modes in which it can operate. So a check mode or an emit mode. So a check mode is not going to return any output, but omit or emit will. <laughs> so uh, they go into detail about how this would work, but essentially the way that they want to call it is uh, they'll call self.go based on whether parse or check was selected and they'll specifically provide the mode that they want to use there. But the mode is generic. Other people can add additional modes to this. It doesn't have to be just the built-in modes that it provides. And so it talks about how the check mode might have a type output that is just unit that doesn't return anything. And then the emit mode might have output that returns the output directly, but you could see other modes being added in uh, that could do more, that could wrap the output or format the output in different ways. Um, that's kind of the power of 
these higher kind of types, the polymorphism, the allowing uh, the behavior to be extended or plugged in uh, externally in ways that you don't directly implement in your library. Another post that was really helpful here was this Reddit thread. <laughs> Could someone explain the gats like I was five? <laughs> and they do a good job. They break it down. They show something similar to the lending iterator, uh, but something that's a mappable uh, that wants to behave different ways uh, based on what, whether it's an option or a result there, uh, both option and result can be mappable types. So they conform to the mappable kind, even though they themselves are generic types based on an internal parameter like that. Uh, and so, yeah, this uh, Reddit thread was really helpful for understanding what, what was going on there. Going back once again to the design pattern section here on the Generic Associated Types Initiative, um, they list out some different projects that are using GATS or projects that are blocked by the lack of having GATS. And uh, one of the things that they mention down here are the general themes. These are why people want GATS. And so a big one is to avoid boxing or cloning, the zero copy API stuff, um, to represent lifetime relationships like that self relationship that we were just talking about, passing it into the associated types. But uh, seeing that, seeing avoiding boxing and cloning, that made me think about one of my favorite CQRS libraries in Rust. Uh, so the serverless technology team uh, has CQRS ES, which is a uh, library, a set of libraries with a, a Postgres backend, the DynamoDB backend, a MySQL backend, essentially that uh, implements CQRS patterns, which is a command and query responsibility separation uh, and event sourcing based on those and uses associated types to good effect when it's modeling an aggregate. Uh, but one of the things that it does with the service, I'm going to pull up their source code here. Um, first off, let me show off the aggregate type inside here, uh, or aggregate trait, an implementation of the aggregate trait here for this bank account struct, which has the account ID and the balance. Uh, this trait has several associated types, and one of those associated types is services, which is intended to represent the services that uh, command handling that the business logic for this event sourced aggregate would use when it's processing commands and reach out to these different services to fulfill those requests, to authorize the requests, to do whatever it needs to, to interact and get the uh, request handled. This bank account services here, if you go uh, back down to that module, it, you'll see that it currently has one property, a services property internally, uh, that has a dynamic implementation of the bank account API trait. You can see the uh, definition of this trait a little further down here. It needs a, an ATM withdrawal method and a validate check method. And so this bank account services is basically saying any, uh, any struct that implements the bank account API trait we want to use as the services property on our bank account services struct. And it's in a box like this because a dynamic implementation can't be sized. The compiler can't, or the, uh, the rest runtime can't put it on the stack because the size of it can't be known uh, at compile time. It can only be known at runtime when it's provided with a dynamic implementation of the bank account API trait. So box allows it to be placed on the heap instead, which can shrink and grow as needed. But this has a downside. This causes the dynamic dispatch overhead I was talking about, uh, prevents inlining, all the stuff that we were looking at um, in the other page. I wanted to find a way to uh, get rid of this box. And my first instinct after reading through all this was, oh, generic associated types have got to be the way to do that, right? <laughs> I, I went down the rabbit hole of trying to adapt this for generic associated types, but ended up finding out that I didn't need them at all. <laughs> this is a non-example because I don't actually need GATS to solve the issue that I was having. Um, if you look at the example here, uh, I started down the road of adding this generic implementation just with the API, uh, which extends bank account API definition here, uh, but I didn't have it passed into bank account yet. And for good reason, this bank account struct here doesn't actually make use of the inner type uh, 
the bank account API implementation that bank account services cares about. So there's really no reason to pass it in here. Uh, but if you don't, if you just try to pass it directly into the associated type down there, um, you run into an error. You'll see a, an error that says the type parameter T is not constrained by the infiltrate self type or predicates unconstrained type parameter. So the impl trait that it's talking about is the aggregate here, the trait that's actually being implemented. And the self type is bank account. That's the uh, struct that the trait is being implemented for, but it doesn't accept any kind of ger generic parameter and it can't get it from that. It can't get it from the predicate. So this uh, bank account API trait that's being extended, that would be an example of a predicate, uh, but it can't get what it needs because what it's doing behind the scenes is instead of setting up a dynamic dispatch um, reference, set of references, it's two references that it balances together for dynamic dispatch. Instead of setting up that system, it wants to, gener to generate concrete implementations of this type that uh, can be statically referenced in the compiled assembly code. So it wants to take every possible thing that this has been invoked with um, at build time uh, and then create separate versions of this uh, for each of those types. What it's doing is requiring you to pass it into the bank account struct here so that it has something to to get this information from so that it has something to track what types it was called with. And the way that I'm passing it in is kind of a trick. It's this phantom data trick because bank account is not using it. It doesn't have any need for it. This phantom data is basically a zero byte uh, pointer or a reference to the type itself in cases where it's not being used. So most often it's going to be in cases where there's unsafe behavior going on. Uh, but occasionally you'll have a situation like this where you're just passing it in to constrain the generic parameter there and it's not actually being used for anything. Uh, so that allows this structure that I've got here uh, to work. That's what pulls everything together. So I didn't need generic associated types here. I just needed to understand better um, how to pass in uh, the type parameters in a way that I could avoid boxing here. Um, so this was my non-example that I was planning to present and uh, ended up not being a thing. <laughs> so hopefully this excursion into generic associated types and some of the different examples around them has been helpful. And hopefully my mistake, my non-example has been helpful too, to see why you don't always need GATs. They're uh, exciting and new, but they're not the solution to a lot of problems. <laughs> so uh, if you need some more information, if you want to dive a little bit deeper, um, I found Chris Biscardi's video here on YouTube, uh, a great overview as well, going into uh, the pointer family examples. So talking about um, a way that you can create a, a kind of pointer uh, that supports different behaviors and then implement that behavior for arcs, which themselves are a generic type uh, or RCs. Uh, and he definitely does a great job of explaining how all this works, how all this fits together and what um, the, the kind of higher kind of behavior that the, this feature can enable. Uh, so check Chris Biscardi's video out there. Uh, it's a great one. Thank you very much for watching tonight. I plan to uh, sit down with Alex Kaliris again this Friday. Uh, it's going to be about uh, 1030 Eastern time or 330 GMT for those of you across the pond. I'd love to see you there. I'd love to answer uh, comments and talk with you there. Uh, you can find me on Discord in a lot of different Rust or programming channels. I'm also on Mastodon on, at bconkle at fostodon.org. See the link in the show notes here. And find me at formidable.com if you'd like to work with Formidable on a project. We've got a variety of experience across the stack, front end, back end, uh, TypeScript, Node, Go, Rust. There's a wide variety of different technologies that we have expertise in now, and we'd love to talk to you about your next project. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you later.